Blog Talk Radio.
I said, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Hey, uh, you know what time it is, honey. It's a wonderful, glorious Wednesday. So, honey, I want you to grab all of your cuppers together because, like I said, you know what time it is, darling. And it's time to dish tea. And you're dishing tea, darlings. <laughs> With big meat. Hey, babies. What's going on, honey? I am feeling kind of refreshed, a little bit rejuvenated today. Yes, 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 honey. The donut making job, baby, kind of wore me out a little bit. So I had a couple of days off, praise the Lord. So I'm feeling a little cute and a little good. Uh, you guys know I got my new my new bi level machine. Uh, um, and for those of you, y'all know I, I have a uh, I have sleep apnea and things. So I got my new machine and I love it. I love it. I love it. I'm using it more regularly than before. Although I just got to stop falling asleep on the couch so I can get to the bed and use it. However, I am using it and I'm punishing myself and making sure that I'm doing the right thing. So I feel wonderful today. I feel absolutely excited. Here it is now, honey. We are 18 days into the new year. You know what my slogan is, honey, taking care of myself, taking care of ourselves in 2012. And so my and I have a theme this year, planes, trains, automobiles and destinations. Honey, I'm calling forth all kinds of travel, business, and luxury, okay, abroad and uh, within the country. So, uh, yes, yeah, so I'm feeling rather cute, so I hope you are too. If you're tuning in and listening by computer and wish to join in on the conversation, please feel free to join in. Call at 347-205-9183. That's 347-205-9183, okay? Just press the number one if you have something to say, and your hand will go up on my switchboard, and I will know that you want to talk to uh, me or the guest that we have on today. Oh, pardon moi. So uh, that there would be absolutely lovely. For those of you who are on your computers and wish to chat over there in the tea room, I just opened it. So the tea room is now open. I ask that you go over there and uh, just be mindful to dish your tea over there responsibly, please. Remember, this is the written word, and sometimes based on our own experiences as we read things, we, we may perceive that the person is saying it in such a way that displeases us. And so we may tend to want to, you know, uh, respond in kind according to our perception. But uh, just remember, over here, it's okay to disagree. Just don't be disagreeable, okay? Because if I see that you're over there cutting up, I will cut you. Capiche? Capiche. <laughs> If you have any questions, comments, concerns, show ideas, uh, dear meat letters, you know I love doing those, please send all of them over there to to me directly at bigmeach at dishingtea.com. That's bigmeach, B-I-G-M-E-A-C-H, at dishingtea.com. Dot com, Or you can go to the website at www.dishingtea.com and you can have uh, see what's going on with me and with the radio show itself. You have a link to my Facebook pages. You'll find out more information about my book, Awakenings, Epiphanies Along the Spiritual Journey. And also you can uh, join in there and um, uh, send in your questions, comments, or concerns over there, okay? So I encourage you to do that, please. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I would greatly, greatly appreciate it. Okay, now let me go here, because I have to say this now, uh, while I'm festive. <laughs> you guys know, honey, that this show is for mature audiences, and the language and or subject matters are not appropriate for children or anyone who's not mature to handle the subject matter. So your listening discretion is advised. I will repeat that. This show, Dishing Tea with Big Meech, is for mature audiences only, and the language and or subject matters are not appropriate for children or anyone who's not mature to handle the subject matters. So your listening discretion is advised. Please note, honey, I have a potty mouth and I make no excuses for it, okay? You guys know that by now. If you don't, shame on you because I've earned it. And I'm going to respectfully use it. I don't know what bag I'm coming out of. Just know that I'm coming out of one, okay? So if you're at work or somewhere 
where it may not be appropriate, I'm going to ask that you lower your volumes, put on your headphone sets, be cute, be appropriate, govern yourselves accordingly. Because none of you bitches are going to get a poet. I'm not going to get no letters. I'm not going to even entertain or answer them if you call me saying that you did not do what you were supposed to do and something happened on your job or the kids had heard something or whatever the case may be. So I'm telling you, govern yourselves accordingly. Okay? Mm hmm. Uh huh. <laughs> now, today's show, honey, we're going to get right into this because I have been. Uh, Waiting to do this. We were going to do this last week. However, uh, we had to push it back until this week, and I've been kind of anxious about it ever since because my guest today uh, is embarking on something that I think is absolutely phenomenal. He's going to have a lot of uh, resistance, and he's up against the world practically because of what it is that he wants to do. Today, I titled today's show, Do You Know... Your sexual partner's status. Hmm? Do you? Okay. Now, this show is going to be a humdinger of a show because, as we all know, many organizations are battling with the CDC to get HIV prevention messages uh, to be a little bit more accurate, a little bit more informal, and downright real, to say the least. And today, my guest has developed an organization that will address the issues by advocating for POS people to fully disclose their status in an effort to reduce and eliminate HIV infection and, and uh, the rate and also to bring about a better uh, way to attack the prevention message. My guest today, his name is Mr. Bradley Fowler. He's the author and an advocate who is best known as the guy who sued the Bible print houses. Um, he's an HIV positive man himself who believes that with full disclosure, we can learn to eliminate the shame and demoralizing uh, practices of HIV positive people and begin to cruise down the road of real treatment, real cure, and real human decency and respect. Now, this is going to be an eye opener for all of you. So I hope you brought all of your crumpets, honey, because the pot is hot. And we are going to dish some tea. So without any further ado, I welcome, welcome, welcome to the show. This is Mr. Bradley LaShawn Fowler. Hello there, Mr. Darling. How are you? Hello, Big Mitch. How are you doing today? Uh, honey, can you tell I got a little spry in my step, baby? <laughs> and it's not liquor, honey. I have not had a cocktail in a few moments or whatever. I'm I'm just excited about this particular show. Because I've been telling folks about it, wanting folks to come on or at least listen, and uh, encouraging folks if they have any questions to call in. Because, uh, as we've talked in 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 private conversations, you know, I'm I'm fully in 100% support of this particular initiative. So, what I want to do now, let's get things on the roll, and let's start right here at the beginning of why you created your organization. Give us the name of it, the full name, and the website, and then give us your uh, your intention for it. Well, first of all, the name of the organization is Positive Life of Positive Living HIV Disclosure Mission. And you can contact me at HIVDisclosureMission.webs.com. Um, initially, I set out on a quest to conquer the issue of stigmatization and discrimination of those who are living with HIV. Myself being positive, um, I understand how challenging it could be to face the issue of sharing our diagnosis with sexual partners. So in an effort to combat that, as I stated, I developed uh, two thought-provoking books to encourage those living with HIV to relinquish their fear of sharing their diagnosis with their sexual partners in an effort to fight the growing HIV infection rate as well as to educate people on the importance of learning how to protect themselves and prevent themselves from being infected with this epidemic. Mm. Okay, now that sounds like a uh it sounds cute and it sounds <laughs> like that should be easy. And I say that because okay, we've heard all of the prevention messages. We know folks who have gotten uh on the bandwagon of wanting to make sure that the prevention message is out there, that we uh have our numbers together, that we're educating folks on this, that and the third. However, 
why is this particular initiative so important as far as disclosure is concerned? I think this is very important because 30 years ago, the infection rate was not as phenomenal as it is today. And it's gotten mm-hmm. so out of hand that teens are now the growing number of individuals being infected with this virus. Ages 13 to 29 now, now account for the growing infection rate in this country. Mm. Mm. Well, yeah, now that's within, that's within the teens. And, uh, wow, that that kind of bothers me a little bit already. That, that just bothers me. It, it saddens me, but let's go here because one of the reasons why that bothers me so is uh, we have a lot of people who claim that they understand what this means. However, their actions don't say don't their actions say otherwise, and that is the whole idea of being undetectable for those who are who have status, and um, for those who are in counseling. You know, those who are the counselors and and things, those who have status and become undetectable, we all know that undetectable does not mean cure. However, we still have a large amount of people who go around believing that because that they're undetectable, that it it means that they cannot spread it anymore. And so they take the chances. They take the risks. Uh, The younger people do not – they didn't have – The horror that we had of watching someone's demise from such um, an illness or what happens when the the infection itself gets to its final stages. The young folks have not, they didn't have that horror story that we did. So now all they know is, okay, if I get it, I could take a pill and I'll be okay. You know, so what is the disconnect in the prevention message that warrants this particular initiative for fully disclosure, where, where are you bridging that gap? First and foremost, I believe everyone should assume that their sexual partner is infected with HIV. That means ask, use protection before practicing intimacy. In doing so, you are taking the precaution to protect yourself and you are taking the precaution to protect other people from being infected. As for those who are living with HIV and who are actively indulging in sexual activity that is promiscuous and continuously spreading this virus in our community, I think it's very important that they understand that due to the fact that you do have a undetectable status does not mean that you are without the infection. Although scientists have begun to release information pertaining to studies stating that those who have an undetectable status have a lower increase of spreading the virus to their sexual partner, we still have to practice safe precautions of preventing other people from being infected with this virus. Okay, now let me play devil's advocate with that, because as a former uh, risk reduction counselor and a case manager and a support uh, HIV support group facilitator, one of the things that we were taught at that time was the whole idea of risk reduction, because we were dealing with people who flat out said that they weren't going to use condoms, Okay. And so the whole idea was not to sit down and browbeat them, or you have to, you have to, you have to, you have to, but to provide options. And with the risk reduction plan, it was, okay, so if you don't use condoms, then let's just come up with something practical. Perhaps, you know, we can limit the number of sex partners you have. Um, uh, Upon ejaculation, you know, you don't uh, ejaculate inside your partner, you know. So we came up with with a number of alternatives that seemed that we wanted to put in place for those who were hell-bent on not using condoms. What is it that we can do and that uh, are fully disclosing uh, one status can do to provide an option for those who want, who don't want to use condoms. 
Well, myself personally, my significant other and I do not practice um, sexual intercourse with the use of contraceptive. And although we've been together for 13 years now, um, I still remain positive and he remains negative. Um, What I would suggest to individuals is, first of all, today they have interactive social networks online for those who are living with HIV where they can find partners who, too, are positive and build long-lasting monogamous relationships. Secondly, I would also insist on abstinence. Although people do not believe in abstinence, I always advocate masturbation. Self-gratification is the first key to safe precaution. So, therefore, in order to prevent those who are living with HIV from continuously spreading this virus, we have to implement strategic plans to prevent them from feeling ostracized and being ridiculed based on the fact that they're HIV positive. Okay. Okay, now let's, let's, let's go there for that ridicule because not only do we get the ridicule from the mainstream society, but then mainstream society breaks down and it, is, it becomes an umbrella term because mainstream, you know, and all of its fears, then we have a breaks down into communities, African-American community uh, versus our counterparts or persons of color versus our counterparts. Then, of course, we have the religious aspect. Then, of course, we have the social aspect. Now we're dealing with social economics. And uh, for those who... Um, um, there was a report that was done here in Atlanta. I, I, I forget if it was nationwide or if it was just here in Atlanta that suggested that a lot of the new HIV infections are coming from the inner cities or the poorer communities. And they're suggesting that because folks are broke, basically, and don't get out and, and don't do nothing with themselves and, and, and all of that, that they end up uh, spending their time fucking. Okay, point blank. Okay, so they're, they're saying that that there is, you know, they've, they've concentrated that into the poor urban areas of a lot of the of, of the major metropolitan um, metropolises across the country. So now, uh, in that, how does disclosure they address those issues? Because the beast is mainstream. And if mainstream is already fearful of those who are positive, what does disclosure or what will disclosure or fully disclosure do to to uh, reduce that fear or at least to educate folks? Well, first of all, disclosing your status to individuals will help the individual that is living with the infection to regain some type of self-esteem boost. Too often people who are infected with HIV, they diminish their self-esteem because they feel as though they have been placed in this bubble and they cannot intermingle as they once did socially. And because of that, disclosure helps them regain that opportunity to intermingle and feel better about themselves. Also, disclosure helps educate individuals that people who are HIV positive come in many shapes, sizes, and colors. Too many times, just because you see somebody dressed in the finest fashion and you assume that they don't have this infection, they are infected. I am a very attractive person, as you can look on the website. (laughs) However, um, many people would never perceive me as being HIV positive. And if I was to go out in a social environment, such as a club, a bar, or anywhere publicly, and intermingle with people, I can pass myself up as not having my virus. And that is one of the flaws that comes with a lack of disclosure. So I believe by disclosing, those who are in those communities who are not capable of attaining the same level of education or resources, it's important that you become an advocate for the educating the community about the importance of understanding HIV, how it can be prevented, and the best measures of identifying who it is that's living with this virus. Okay. 
All right, now let me go here because, again, I'm, I'm, let me play devil's advocate right here because when I suggested this, I had someone blatantly say to me, okay, what the, hell is, what the hell is he proposing? Because what is this? I'm just supposed to now walk around with a red ribbon tattooed on my forehead and they're just going to send me off to a fucking concentration camp? That ain't nobody's <laughs> business if I'm positive. Why do I have to disclose? Well, according to the law, anyone that's living with HIV who fails to disclose their status to a sexual partner has committed a crime, first of all. This is why I have developed some very nice, Retail apparel that has information about disclosure messages that will help an individual disclose their status without sharing it verbally. Mm. So, so you so kind of like, like the, the the what's the name bracelet? You know the the little the little I fall in I can't get up bracelets and the things. Well, right? I've, I've seen I've seen individuals with pods P two P. Uh, bracelets. They have tattoos out now. They have a lot of things to advocate for disclosure. So we really don't have, um, we can't say, well, I don't know how to do this anymore. Because there's a million and one ways to share your diagnosis. Okay. It's the lack of concern for another person's well being that's not being considered with the spread of this virus. Hmm. People believe that no one's watching them. But I am a strong believer that those who are living with HIV, even though you have probably given a false name when you were tested, the CDC has a record of who you are. The CDC knows where you live. And Big Brother is always watching our activities. So it's advisable that you be cautious about your actions. Okay, now here's something. Uh, well, let me stay. Let me stay here first, and then I'm gonna go back to to getting personal because you hit something in the early stages of this, and I I can't I cannot let that go by. But anyway, um, I personally I do not believe in putting the onus completely on the positive person as far as um, this being criminal. Right now, I think it's a travesty that the positive person uh, now has the potential of being labeled a criminal simply because they don't disclose their status. Now, having said that, um, the, the first part of this is how can we get to the lawmakers and things to put responsibility on the non-positive person who don't want to take responsibility for their sexual education. Because, I, like I said, I don't think that that's fair. You know, here it is, someone who is positive, and everything rests on your shoulders. The whole idea of whether or not I tell this person, if I don't tell, what does this mean? And I know when I was in training, when, when um, um, we were taught that penetration uh, is defined as any time there is uh, one uh, one body part that goes into an orifice of someone else's. So that means if I took my finger and put my finger in your ear, I have penetrated you. And because I did not reveal my status, you can then take me to jail or have me arrested for attempted murder. And I think that there is like the strongest charge that I know of, right, that I've heard for someone who's HIV positive. Um, so what is going to be put in place, or has anybody tried to fight on that level to make sexual education the priority or the responsibility for everyone and not just the pause person? Well, nowadays, many high school Department of Education have incorporated the system to encourage students to take part in sexual education. And HIV education has been implemented as a must in many states, such as Nevada. They make it a mandatory thing for students to have HIV education. Secondly, criminalization of HIV, there are debates today that are being employed to fight the 
criminalization of those living with HIV because a lot of people such as yourself and, and others do not believe that people living with this virus should be criminalized. However, again, the biggest issue is a lack of understanding on the facts. A lot of people still believe that they can contract HIV by touching a doorknob handle behind someone or sleeping on the same sheets as someone that's infected or drinking from the same cup as someone that's infected. We're 30 years into this epidemic, and although the numbers have increased, if you really pay attention to it, it's not as widespread as we think it is. Hmm. So we need to take a more serious approach towards being aware of our own self and our own actions when it comes to sexual involvement. Yeah, he's cute. Yeah, she's beautiful. But always remember Magic Johnson. Excuse me if I, you know, for speaking out his name out of order, but Magic Johnson still looks good. And his wife is still with him. She loves him very much. But mm. people are HIV positive, and you don't know who has it. So always assume that everyone is infected. Okay. Okay. Now, let me get into your business for just a second. Because here is the thing. And, well, women, let me back up a bit because I, I need to put this out here. And that is, I I attempt not to show my judgment in people, okay, because I don't have that authority. But it, it angers me whenever I hear someone who is positive, and I know several people who's done this, who are positive, won't tell nobody that they are. And yet we'll go through the motions and the notions of entertaining the person sexually and then have that, well, that's his fault mentality. You know, well, oh, well, he didn't open up his mouth mentality. And I always tell folks, if you can remember the day that you were told that you were positive and how you felt when the doctor had to tell you that or the tester had to tell you that and the person you slept with didn't, if you're okay with making someone, having someone go through that same feeling, when you look at yourself in the mirror to brush your teeth and you can honestly say you're fine with that, then that's between you and God. But if at all that you cannot muster up enough strength to say that you're 100% fine with that, why would you put someone through that agony? That has always been my stance on that, okay? And it comes across as judgmental because some of the folks that I've said that very same thing to, I love with all my heart, you know, and we all have our own quirks and our own character flaws. But that one right there seems to to be one that that sticks in my crawl because what that does is that it takes away the other person's choice. It takes away the other person's options. It takes away the other person's freedom because now you've imprisoned me to your shit. Okay? Unknowingly. Okay? Now, again, the flip side is if I didn't ask the questions, you know, and sit down and I know we are hot nutted and bothered and carry it on, but there has to be some place in there where dialogue takes place, even if this person is going to lie, which nine times, well, I'll say eight, eight times out of ten, a person will lie, okay, and say, no, no, no. But even in that particular stance, if the person or if I am not given the full opportunity to sit down and to make the conscious choice to say, yes, I'm going to do this, then I, you know, I just have I have a whole big problem with that, and I said all that to say, with full disclosure, okay, that particular element of it, you know, the whole idea of those who don't want to, those who want to sit up there and really be rigid about it, those who are on this quest out of anger and maliciousness who feels as though society has wronged them or God has wronged them because they got this and now I'm going to do this, 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 and this to make someone else suffer. 
How did you address that issue? That's the challenge that we deal with on a daily basis. No matter how much we advocate for disclosure, there will always be individuals who will follow their own state of mind and say, I'm going to vicariously live my life without disclosing my status. We will never be able, and I will repeat this, we will never be able to combat this epidemic unless everyone living with HIV accept the fact that they have been victimized. It's not that you went out and you said, okay, well, just infect me, although there are bug chasers, but we were victims of someone else's lack of knowing they were infected because, as you know, 27% of people living with HIV today do not know their status. Also, we were victimized because we were not given the opportunity that we supposed to or should give to other people. So, therefore, the biggest issue is lack of compassion for ourselves before we can think about the concerns of other individuals. Too many people have this mindset that, as you stated, I'm going to give this to somebody else because I'm dealing with this. But, as I stated, we never know who it is that we are encountering sexual activities with, and we never know who's watching or listening what we're saying and what we're doing. Are you, As you know, just because they tell us that, okay, we live in a country of freedom, your name is registered, your address is registered. And if you're on medication, you can want to pick up a prescription, you have insurance, all of your information, pertinent contact information is available mm. for people mm. to surveillance your activities. So it's very unfortunate that we live in a society that is so open but dishonest about the fact that I have HIV. When I first found out I was positive, I lived in denial for the first three or four years. I didn't want to tell nobody. I didn't want to discuss it. When I told my family, when I told my youngest sister that I was infected, she said, you know what, I can't allow you to be around your nephews until I take them to the doctor with me and find out, is it okay for them to be in your in your presence? Because I don't want you to give my children something that they can't get rid of. The impact of hearing those words come out of her mouth stung for many years because I could not comprehend why would you subject me to this type of harsh reality when I've already had to deal with waking up every day knowing I'm infected with this virus that will eventually take my life. So until people reach out for the assistance that they need, such as counseling, professional assistance, and understanding of knowledge to a build up or enhance their understanding of what it is they're dealing with, we're going to face a dilemma with disclosure continually. Hmm. Okay, now let me press pause right here. Um, if you're just tuning in, honey, you are listening to this is Mr. Bradley um, Fowler, and we're talking about the uh, the – Understanding and the importance of fully disclosing one's HIV status, and um, we're going to get into that real soon uh, when we come back on the other side of this break. Let me say hello to my sponsors and let them come on in here, and uh, we'll be right back in about two and two, okay? So I shall return. Take yourself and your thoughts to the next level with Above Consciousness Clothing, the clothing that not only brings about style and character, but it also raises the bar of consciousness so that we can be a better people, a better community, a better humanity. Whether it is to turn your tickle box over with our whimsical designs or challenge your thoughts and beliefs with our social awareness designs, Above Consciousness Clothing is sure to titillate your spirit, tantalize your senses, and rivet your soul. Welcome to the next evolution of fashion above consciousness clothing for more information please go to our facebook page at facebook.com forward slash above consciousness clothing the big brothers network yeah men of color men of size the big brothers network was created to celebrate the larger man of color and those who admire him we intend to promote a positive self-image within our community and the mainstream population. Our goal is to embrace our differences, to inspire self-love, and increase camaraderie through positive 
brotherly interactions. We intend to accomplish these goals through the BBN magazine, local and national events, and networking forums. For more information or to catch the latest copy of the BBN magazine, please go to www.bigbrothersnetwork.com. That's www.bigbrothersnetwork.com. The Big Brothers Network, men of color, men of size. Trade Day Management and Publicity Firm, an Atlanta-based PR production and management consultancy firm specializing in aggressive publicity and exposure campaigns, artist development, leveraging mutually beneficial relationships, and brokering deal with integrity. At Trade Day Management, enjoy a touch of Southern hospitality with a universal appeal. For all of your public relations and entertainment management needs, contact Travion Davenport at 678 678- Five two three three zero eight eight. That's six seven eight five two three three zero eight eight. Or email at tradeaypr at gmail dot com. That's trade t r e a d a y p r at gmail dot com. Trade day management and publicity firm. The Caribbean American Boys Entertainment. We specialize in jerk and conch food catering, party promotions and emceeing, entertainment with the Caribbean swagger, island fever on the mainland, bam bam. (laughs) We also provide customized tour guides through gay-friendly Bahamas to all the hot spots of dining and club life events. Mr. Savano T. DeMarco is the founder and CEO of the CABC. For more information, please contact him at CaribbeanBoysATL at Yahoo.com. That's CaribbeanBoys with a Z, ATL, at Yahoo.com or on Facebook at Facebook.com forward slash Savano T. DeMarco. That's Facebook.com forward slash Savano T. D M A R. C-O. Caribbean American Boys Entertainment. Island Fever on the mainland. Bam, bam. All right, all right, and we are back. And you're still here dishing tea with Big Meat. If you're just joining in, honey, and you want to come in on the conversation, please feel free. Call in at 347-205-9183. That's 347-205-9183. Today's show title is Do You Know Your Sexual Partner Status? We're talking about the importance of uh, full disclosure of one's HIV status, and we're here with Mr. Bradley Fowler, who is embarking on a brand new organization that is going to help us with understanding the importance of fully disclosing one's um, HIV status and also to help with its prevention of spreading the HIV virus or infection and also to help with better educating our communities. Now, I see I have someone that wanted to come in um, and have a question or two, so I'm going to go here, 248 Six eight eight. That's two four eight six eight eight. Hello there, caller. You're on the air. You're dishing tea with Big Meat. Say hello to yes, us. Yes. Hello. Caller. How are you? Hello. Yes. I'm go on ahead, the air. Can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead. Okay. Yes, I have a question uh, for Mr. Fowler. Um, you had mentioned earlier uh, in the show that I guess uh, right now the largest uh, contributors uh, of the HIV uh infection uh is uh, ages 13 to 29 so my question is you also mentioned uh criminal law does the criminal law also apply to those uh 13 to 17 within that 13 to 29 uh age group criminalization hmm, embodies those who are infected with HIV Juvenile, I would consider that to be a juvenile offense more so than an adult offense. Oh, so basically so they'll be tried as juveniles. Same, same uh, criminalization. Uh, mo criminal criminalization, but because they're juveniles, they'll be tried tried in juvenile uh, court systems. Is that what, what what we're saying? Correct. Interesting. Okay. Yes. My next question is. Um, in talking about the, the age group 13 to 17, because I think this is very important. I heard uh, Big Meek say earlier uh, that uh, that age group, they really didn't see the faces of death. So 
So now I'm the father of a, a 16-year-old uh, teenage boy uh, who is not positive. But if he were, how in the world would I be able to get him to disclose that fact openly at such a young age uh, when it's hard to get him to go to school or to brush his teeth or comb his hair or anything that a, a normal teenager, uh, I don't want to say normal, a teenager who is not infected with HIV. Do you understand? So is Correct. there a plan? Is what My question, I guess, is is there a plan that you have or that someone else has set in place um, that will make that 13 to 17-year-old feel more comfortable uh, in disclosing? Due to the fact that 13 to 29 now are accounting for the highest infection rate in our country, I think it's important that all HIV organizations, implement strategic plans to educate this specific group of individuals on how important it is to abstain from sexual practices first and foremost because a child or I'll say a young adult should not be placed in the position to deal with the stresses of learning how to interchange sexual activity at that age in the first place. Secondly, mm -hmm. it depends on the parent because the parent is responsible for their child until so that child turns 18. So I think the parents need to become more instrumental in educating themselves on the issue of HIV and what age group and what target demographics are most being affected by this. If you have a child that is HIV positive, enhancing that child's ability to understand that they have a virus that can spread onto someone else and cause an individual the same level of discomfort, uh, mental and emotional duress, educating them on that first and first and is very important. Secondly, it's important to educate the team that you cannot go out and dis without disclosing your status to other partners because you can be criminalized. Hmm. Now, you mentioned uh, the parent being responsible. So in that, because the parent is responsible legally until the child is 18 years uh, of age, if the child were positive and now somehow these criminal uh, laws come into place, could not the parent then be charged also? Is this what we're saying is, is happening here? Mm. With our judicial system, it's it, the judicial system is the most challenging aspect of our country. And I say that because I am a certified paralegal, and the laws change consistently. One day they advocate for uh, criminalization on one issue, and then tomorrow they're changing the law. So I cannot answer that for you thoroughly, but what I can say is this. Any parent that has a child, and I have nieces and nephews, I was a child myself, my although my parents um, attempted to prevent me from being exposed to sex at an early age, I always assumed my parents didn't know what they were talking about. So I always went outside of the home to engage in activities that was displeasing to my parents. So parents need to be more aware that they were children themselves, and you have to put yourself in your child's shoes at some point in time and think about, well, what is it that I should be discussing with my child? We have a tendency in our country of not feeling comfortable discussing sex with young adults. But in order to prevent them from continuously being subjected to things such as STDs, we have to take the initiative and the responsibility and educate our teens on how to protect themselves and others from being exposed to such epidemics. Wow. Now, see, that's profound right there. That, let me interject right here, because one of the things that th that's a missing component is most parents uh, – Tend to you know every, a lot of parents are still under the do as I say not as I do rule, and right. a lot of children end up end up repeating the same behaviors that they see the parents doing because as you see now uh, we got the the thirty nine year old grandmama 
okay, who's still young enough to sit up there and put her, put her snatchback ponytail in her head, still wear her skirts as short as her goddamn granddaughter, and then want to sit out here and go get her a nice piece. So when the children are mimicking the, the behavior of the parents, um, where is the responsibility lying then? Because we have a lot of kids who become emancipated, a lot of children who end up becoming, you know, they're raising themselves, you know. And like the caller was saying, you know, when you have kids who are on the rebellious stage anyway, they're 16, 17, you know, at that age where um, – you know, they don't want to necessarily stay up under the realms of their parents to begin with because, you know, they think they know everything and don't know shit and, and, and all of that. You know, wh- where is, I guess it's not so much as responsibility, who can they turn to for help? What are, you know, are there anything out there? Is is this what you're, what you're saying is part of the education thing that needs to go on? Because there's there's some things out there that where parents need help and being able to bring this kind of information uh, forthcoming. And then, as you say, if the laws are still changing, you know, technically, I'm still responsible for the actions of my child. If you're coming to me because he don't go to school or she don't go to school, and yet you're going to throw me in jail for his truancy, because they do that there in Michigan, um, what the hell says that if this child go out here on a fuck fest that you're not going to come after me because he didn't do what he wanted to do, or she didn't do what she wanted to do. How, there's, a, there's a disconnect. That's, Go that's ahead, me, Charlie. That's the biggest question that everybody has to answer. And there is no answer for it at this time because nobody mm, wants to collaborate that? on ideas. This how about organization that wants funding for their purpose and their prevention methods. Oh, Another wait, organization, wait, wait. instead of coming together and unify to build a strategic plan to focus on how we can combat this issue, we will always have indifferences. And in in that, parents will continue to to lack or feel uh, unaware or insufficient of the information that is provided for them. A lot of times, I mean, if we look at everybody, we're all human, so we're all going to make mistakes. And just because one counselor is capable of expressing uh, expounding information that encourages individuals to prevent this spread. There's other counselors who are not certified, who are practicing uh, to counsel parents, and parents are not feeling comfortable in that environment. So we have to look at the church environment. The church is one of the biggest supporters in the urban community. So it's, it, I think it's the church's responsibility to Establish programs where parents can come in and listen to forums that educate them on how to deal with this issue. Another issue is a lot of people are ignorant to the fact that my child is a homosexual because we have a lot of down low people. This has become a part of our mainstream society. My child does not indulge in this activity because my child is a straight-A student. The parent never wants to accept the fact that their child is indulging in sexual activity. So these are things that parents need to understand, that communication is key in understanding how to relate to your child. You can't always be the brow-beating parent. You've got to sometimes sit back and take a, a reflection on your past and say, hmm, what is it that my child is not doing? What is it that mm. I can be doing to encourage my child to become a better par and better productive citizen? What is it that I can be doing to encourage my child to understand the importance of waiting to have sex until you finish college? These are okay. the keys to combating this issue. Interesting. Carla, did you have anything else to say? Yes, I just wanted to say that um, uh, I can give my child condoms. I can talk to him about the importance of using that condom. But when it's all said and done, I can't make him use it. No, you can't. No, you can't. Okay. You know, so that, that's where the problem becomes. It's his choice. And unfortunately, on some occasions, he has chosen not to use them, although they are provided for him. 
and I applaud you. He is educated, and he is educated uh, and aware of HIV and other diseases and pregnancy. All of these things we have talked about. And again, you know, at the age of 13, um, I handed him the box of condoms after we had the conversation, and he said, oh, I don't need these. And I said, well, it's better to have them and not need them than to need them and not have them. Okay, you guys, let, 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 well, you know what? Well, hold on, hold on, hold on. Because before we go patting that back, what was your in, what was your message to him when you just gave him a box of condoms? Because there's a disconnect there for me. No, 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 no. no. I, I said after the conversation, after we uh-huh. talked about sex, after we talked about disease and sexual encounters, pregnancy, uh-huh. preventative measures, now here is a box of condoms. Okay, my question there is extended. Did you teach him how to use one? Because that there yes, is well, also a disconnect. Yes, of course. Okay, yes, well, I can, well, I don't want to. I, I I don't want to just assume because how you just stated that. It, this is this is why I'm questioning. The way you right. stated that was we had to talk. I had him a box of condoms, and he said he didn't need them. Okay, the disconnect in in that is the whole is the whole avenue. Yes, we we discussed this. We discussed this. We discussed this. I showed him the proper way to use this. So that he knows how to put them on, because that there is something that's not discussed hardly. Yeah, we done gave you a condom, but you hear the story. A lot of folks say they don't use them because they don't know how to put them on. They're too tight. They roll them backwards. They don't know to put a, a drop of lube in the condom so that you can you have to pinch the top, you know, and all of that. So that's that's why I don't, I don't mean to insult you. I'm just asking that because that there was the disconnect in that particular conversation. And if it was easy for me to do that with you. Imagine what other folks are doing because they've done just that. They didn't do the uh, the, the step by step. So yeah. So all right. Was there anything else, Carla? No. Thank you so much for the time. All right. Thank you. Well, you thank you. Man. Thank you. Now let's go here because you you mentioned something, and I have to get on this because as an African American man, an African American gay man in this society, you mentioned the church being the backbone of everything, and everybody waiting on this particular conversation. And as I said in your introduction, you know that you are known across the globe as the man who has challenged and has gone up against and have a lawsuit against two of the Bible printing companies based on them t- changing the wording of the Bible to include the word homosexual when it wasn't there before. And I'm saying all that because, as you said, the church being the backbone, we have a lot of issues surrounding HIV HIV disclosure, HIV information and education, where the church act as if they want to do it. They done got this damn money from these uh, faith-based organizations, uh, monies that were supplied to them from the federal government, and yet they still ostracize those who are positive. I don't care where it is in this country. There's a lot of folks out there who still ostracize those babies for being positive and then want to sit up there and want to um, throw out the, uh, you know, the the whole fire and brimstone homosexual uh, 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 sermons, okay? And and that, you know, because of, there's still some, some, tra- some, I won't say tradition, I'm going to say primitive churches who still go out spewing that venom that HIV is a punishment from God, and you got it because you're filthy and you're nasty. I have somebody who's who uh, I know who discloses this information, and, and here's something. Wait, wait a minute. I, let me let me. I'm, I'm mixing two different things. Let me go there. And let me stick with that first. Start go there with with the church's responsibility or lack of responsibility in assisting with the prevention education. Well, first of all, let me answer your question pertaining to the civil complaint that I filed against three of the leading Bible publishing corporations in this country. Um, I was reared in a home that 
advocated religious tradition and beliefs. And I embrace church as a traditional way of being, and I developed a belief in a higher entity. However, I was always bombarded with um, negative connotations about my sexuality. My father, for one, stated that I was going to go to hell if I did not indulge in regular sexual activity. Um, However, I had older uncles who were openly homosexual. And once I was introduced to the lifestyle, uh, the ideology that I was incorporated with from the church became an issue of combat that I had to struggle with. So as I grew and and started experiencing life, I met other individuals who were openly gay. Nevertheless, later in life, I wanted to understand why is it that I was subjected to this form of sexual orientation without being able to argue against it because of the way society perceives us to being as deviants. So I went in search of the great answer, and in my quest to gain that answer, I took comparative religious courses in college. I took Bible study courses through uh, Bible correspondence programs, and I became an ordained minister through Universal Life Monastery. In doing so, I learned the history of the religion that I, or the denomination and the um, religious sect that I am a part of, which is I confess Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, so I confess to be a Christian. Um, but one thing that I, I have come to understand is that many people lack understanding on the history of our religion and how the doctrine was developed. I, for one, did not know that there were Bible committees that sat around at round tables and revised the scripture in, a, in an effort to convey clarity for lay person. So in doing so, we come out with the NIV, which is the new international version. We come out with the revised King James version. But what we fail to realize is that revisions and revisement means that someone went in and altered what the doctrine stated. However, in the process of me learning all of this information, I began to understand, well, when why is homosexuality the biggest issue in the Bible? Well, I started pulling Bibles together. I had 14 Bibles out, and I compared scripture from books that were published from 1968 up until 2007, and not one of those Bibles read the same in the scripture, which is 1 Corinthians 6, 9, that states that homosexuals will not inherit the kingdom of God. In the process of me understanding that someone had played around with this issue, I got upset. Ignorantly, I filed a cause of action. And I say ignorantly because at the time, I was not fully in tune with the procedure of law. This is what evoked me to become a paralegal because I wanted to understand how the process of filing a civil procedure in our court system actually manifest. Um, during the course of me defending my cause of action, which was mental and emotional duress based on the fact that they incorporated the idea that homosexuals were not here at the kingdom of God, um, I presented my petitions, my motions to the district court in the Eastern District of Michigan, and luckily I had many of my motions ruled in favor of. However, I had many who were denied. Um, after the going through the district court, I ended up going through the court, Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals. Um, that process led me to the United States Supreme Court. Now, this is where it became tricky because there is a 90-day process after your final decision or court order from the Sixth Circuit Court to submit mm-hmm. a um, Redistoria to the United States Supreme Court. Well, I was under the impression that Saturday and Sundays and federal holidays was excluded in that time frame. However, according to the Supreme Court's legal procedures, 90 days is 90 days. So I did not submit my Redistoria in a timely manner. Therefore, my petition was rejected and the case was resolved. Nevertheless, 
The fact still remains that these Bible committees continuously revise the text. I contacted the American Bible Society and asked them for permission to incorporate scripture from the Bible in a book that I was writing on the history of homosexuality and how it affects religion ideology in today's society. The American Bible Society responded and stated that there was no permission needed to be granted to utilize the scripture because the scripture is public domain. The copyright on the original text has expired. Therefore, Mm. it can be used at will. That means that you and I can sit down together at a round table with ten other people and say, okay, we're going to develop a Bible. And in the process of us developing that Bible, we can rewrite the scripture any way we want to write it. This is why I advocate that people use Bibles that were published before 1970, because those Bibles, to me, are more structured in what the text teaches. The Bible teaches us that some people will rise up in our society and twist the words until their own destruction and lead people away from the faith. That is why the church has been bombarded with so much controversy because there are so many mixed messages. What needs mm-hmm. to be happening is that they need to take the Bible and re put it back, re- restore it, and put it back to where it was and stop allowing various committees to publish this Bible. However, we have freedom of the press. We also have freedom of the speech. So, again, we always have to look at the issue. The issue is our laws are continuously being fixed or changed to combat the needs and desires of one part of society or the next. This is why we have Democratic and we have Republicans because there's always an opposing team that's going to combat what another team brings forth. Mm-hmm. Wow. Now that there and is if I rich, may add, I'm, excuse me, if go I may ahead. add, you can learn more about what I am explaining to you by logging on to Matthew two 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 nine dot webs. That's W E B S dot com. Okay, I like that. I'm going to put that in the tea room. Say that again. That's Matthew, Matthew 2229.webs.com. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Okay, yeah. All right, I'm, I'm, wow. Okay. Now, see, that, that, see I'm, I, that can take us into a whole nother thing. But let's but let me let let me stay topical here because I want to make sure that see all of that I know is the premise behind a lot of what we experience in 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 the religious community as far as HIV is concerned. So now that you're having this information, have you presented uh, your organization to other churches. What about like MCC or, or LGBT affirming churches? What are you? What kind of support are you getting um, to rally around what it is that you're doing? Particularly since this is a part of the prevention message. Um, initially, I was featured in Pause Magazine, which is a nationally and globally distributed HIV publication. I was also it's featured in HIV Plus and HIV Positive magazine, which is published and distributed in the Atlanta area. Um, I initially wrote a book called How to Share Your HIV Disclosure with Your Sexual Partners, Family, and Friends. Um, of course, uh, self-publishing this book, I had to endure a lot of revisions. However, no one responded to the message of disclosure. I received negative response and I did supporting response. Since then, I gained my charter through the state of Las Vegas, Nevada, and the Secretary of State and launched Positive Life for Positive Living HIV Disclosure Mission with hopes of building a forum that would be instrumental in encouraging those living with HIV to gain knowledge to encourage them to relinquish their diagnosis. Funding has been scarce. 
I attempted to actually I applied for a mm-hmm. grant with the CDC, and due to the fact that my organization was newly designed and it did not have a national focus at that particular time, the CDC denied my grant request. However, I recently received information pertaining to grants that are available to me, and I have begun drafting grant proposals to submit for funding. However, in my quest to disseminate information via the Internet, I have been blocked on Facebook. Um, I really? have been Correct. I have been blocked on Facebook uh, on many occasions. That's why I have I have three locations on Facebook instead of one. Um, no one responds to any of the emails that I send out. My press releases are not, they're actually discarded. Um, so I am facing a lot of opposition with this campaign because apparently people are not concerned with people with HIV. It's not a big issue. Really? Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Oh, okay. To answer your question, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. To answer your question about did I contact any church, I did contact MCC, which is Metropolitan Community Church, one of the largest uh, accepting churches of the LGBT community, and spoke with the director um, who guided me towards a specific church in the area of Detroit, Michigan. She informed me that uh, they had to close a lot of the churches due to the lack of funding because, as you know, churches also are 501c3s, which designate them as nonprofit organizations. So churches right. also operate on the means of their supporting congregations. And uh, nowadays, with our society going through this with change of relinquishing the idea that religion is important, which is foolish because we cannot exist without something higher than ourselves. I don't care how much material you own or how much money you possess, there is always something greater going on after you leave this existence. So ignorantly, people have stepped away from the church. Okay, well... Yes, they have, but I'm, I'm going to throw something in that pot because I'm one of those people who left the church, but it's not because of ignorance. What it is is if if a lot of folks are on the same bandwagon that I am, it's a lot of the hypocrisy. And just like you just outlined as far as them twisting and moving and taking stuff out of that Bible that they want everybody to believe is the word of God, um, my consciousness has evolved from that because how of how it is taught. And it's not so much as what's in it, it's how everybody teaches it. And just like you say, everybody now has their own interpretation, and nobody wants to search these scriptures for themselves, and then we're taught that we're wrong if we get epiphanies and things that takes us to a higher level. So many of us, and particularly those of us who are LGBT, who are not caught up in singing in the choir because Karen Clark Sheard is the first lady of the church <laughs> or whatever. Uh, yeah, I went there. Um <laughs> because of that, uh, you know, or I'm not singing, and, and you know, and backflipping with Ricky D. 